Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Nate Shipman. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. I'm super excited this morning. <laughs> I'm super excited. God is doing something, and I want to point this out. There are two things that Josh said this morning from God that are the main points of what I have to tell you. There are two things. The first thing he said was, I want to impart confidence in you. The second thing was the poverty mindset. Those are two things that are central to what I have been eating on, chewing on, and I'm ready to throw it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm ready to give it to you. I'm ready to give it to you. I'm just so excited. I'm just going to jump right in. Is that cool? All right. This is something that I'm, I might have shared bits and pieces uh, just whenever I have the chance to, you know, get the microphone, but... Um, this is something that I want to dive deep into, um, and try, I just kind of want to give you all of it. You know, I don't want, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Daryl, you're the man. Um, I want to give you all of it. I don't want to hold anything back here. If you got your Bibles, please uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. All right. And while you're turning there, I kind of want to do this deductively. I want to give you the main point, and then I want to show you the proof. Okay? And then I'll come back to the main point later. And what I, the main point of my message today is that you and I are meant to live in glory instead of grace. We are meant to live in glory, not in grace. That's my main point. And I want to, I want to start by what that means, how to apply that, what it looks like in your life, what it means to live in glory, and what it means to live in grace. And here's what I mean. You might be able to kind of already tell where I'm going with this, but like I said, I'm not holding anything back. Here we go. So to live in glory, to live in glory, what does that mean? What I think it means, it, it means to be hyper aware of God, to be hyper aware of God. And that looks like constantly listening to him, constantly thinking about him, constantly allowing him to be part of your life. Anytime that you have a decision, you bring it to God. You say, what do you think? That's what it looks like to live in glory. You're expecting God to show his glory in every situation. What is glory? It's the manifestation of God. I think of it this way. The glory of God is what he does. God is who he is. When we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about how he shows it. Does that make sense? The glory of God is what he does. And this is the main the main thing that differenti differentiates between living in glory and living in grace is the way that we approach him. Whenever we live in glory, we approach him with confidence. We approach him with boldness, knowing who we are in him and knowing where we stand with him. Right? That's what it means to live in glory. The flip side, what it means to live in grace what it means to live in grace, I think of it as a poverty mindset. Here's why. To live in grace, I think, is to be, is to be hyper aware of yourself. It's to be hyper aware of yourself. It's to be hyper aware of your sin rather than God. To live in grace, I think, is to be hyper aware of your sin. It's to identify as a sinner. 
is to constantly rely on grace to save you rather than moving on to glory. If you know that you're saved, then you live in glory. You don't live in grace. If you know that you're saved, because the word says, we're going to talk about it here in a second, it says grace is what saves you. You have to know that you're saved, right? And the main thing is how we approach God. To live in grace means to approach God. Instead of confidence, it's timidity. Instead of boldness, it's fear. Fear of what? Fear of judgment. That's what I think. Fear of judgment. To live in grace means to constantly rely on grace and to approach God with timidity and fear of judgment. So that's my main point. And we're going to dive in the Word. Y'all ready? Ephesians 2, we're going to start in verse 4. Okay? This is right after Paul says, you are once children of wrath. Does that sound familiar? This is kind of a uh, staple. This passage is kind of a staple to the faith. And there's a lot here. This passage right here, I think, um, does a really good job of explaining what grace is and what it does. And that's kind of the way I'm organizing this. We're going to talk about grace with this passage, then we're going to talk about glory with another. But what is grace? God's unmerited favor, right? That's the easiest way to remember it. God's unmerited favor. It means that he has favor on you because he wants to. <laughs> Bottom line, not because of what anything that you've done, but because he wants to. And that's it. That's what unmerited means, right? But he has favor for you. He wants what's best for you. He prefers you. Yeah, last week we talked about loving God means to prefer him, to have preference. Well, he does the same thing. He prefers you. All right, we're going to start in verse 4. Here we go. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He says in Christ Jesus both times. We get it, Paul. Okay. Um, I'm going to kind of take you through like a little word study. And trust me, anytime you do a word study, you get deeper meaning. Every time. It's crazy. But as I was reading this passage, I had some questions. But then I got answers, and that's what I want to share with you. So here we go. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. I came back to the very roots, and I asked God, what is mercy? What is that? And this is what I got. Mercy is not just, it's not only God withholding punishment or withholding discipline. Well, actually, that's not really a good word. I'm just going to stick with, it's not just withholding punishment, right? Because discipline's not always punishment. Anyway, whatever. It's not just withholding punishment. It's also God's loyalty to his covenant. I think it's two sides of the same coin. He withholds judgment, but he also is loyal to what he has promised you. Right? What he has promised you in his new covenant. Right? And in this passage, whenever it says, um, because of the great love... We are talking about preference here. It's the same thing. Because of the preference that he had for you, because of the 
because of the fact that he prefers you, he prefers relationship with you, he prefers to be with you rather than to be alone, it's because of that, right? That's how he starts this off. But then I, I asked God, I said, why, why does it say because of the great love with which he loved us? Why is this in past tense? I think it's because he was referring to something that he previously talked about. And I think it's referring to the action of sending his son. John 3, 16 God loved the world in this way. He gave his son, right? He gave his son. I think that's the love that he's talking about. Because of the great love with which he loved us, it's because of the great love with which he loved us. We could read it this way. It's because of the fact that he sent his son that, so on and so forth. Are you following me? Cool. Let's move on to verse 5. Dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I think the reason that he has, like, it's like an interruption, right? He says, by grace you have been saved. Just so you know my main point here, by grace you have been saved, don't miss it. Right? The reason that I think he does that is because he is saying that grace is what accomplishes what he said before. And what he said before was, dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. Here's what I got. Grace is what brings you from death to life. Grace is what does that. Here's what, I want to point this out. Here's what I'm not trying to say today. I'm not trying to say that grace and glory are opposite. They're not. I'm not trying to say that glory is right and grace is wrong. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm saying is that to live in glory is the opposite of to live in grace. What I am trying to say is that grace and glory go hand in hand. That's what I'm trying to say. I just want to clear that up. What I'm not trying to say is that they're opposite. They're not. They're not. And what I'm also not trying to say is that glory is more important than grace. I'm not trying to say that either. I believe they are equally important. Without either of them, we wouldn't know salvation. We wouldn't know God. We wouldn't know Jesus. Okay? Just want to clear that up. All right? Here's the next thing I have. Okay, well, let me backtrack. Grace is what brings us from death to life. And he goes on, and he says that he raised us up with him and seated us with him, who? God, in the heavenly places. Right? I think that he has that sentence, grace through faith, right? He says, by grace you have been saved. He puts that in the middle because he's saying that grace is what brings you from death to life, and grace is also what raises you and seats you with God. Grace is what does that. It's because of his grace that you are alive and that you are raised and that you are seated with God in heaven. It's because of grace, right? That's the main point that he's, I think he's trying to get across here. To raise is a spiritual resurrection. And I, don't think, I think that it's very, very similar, if not directly parallel, to Jesus raising from the grave. That was a physical resurrection, but in the same, it's, it was a spiritual resurrection. And for us, we can experience the same thing spiritually. And I want to point this out. The word seated. What does seated mean? Is there any deeper meaning to that? To sit. To be seated next to him. Here's what I got. To sit somewhere. To sit is to stay. Is to live. And it's to rest in the presence of God. Is to stay, is to live, is to rest in the presence of God. Right? That's what, I think that's kind of the, the meat there. And then obviously he says heavenly places, which we're in the heavenly places where God's presence is. Right? I believe that that's where God's glory is. 
is because he is constantly showing his presence. He is constantly, we are allowed to constantly behold his presence in its, in its purest form, right? Heavenly places. And that's not to say that we can't experience heaven on earth because Jesus prayed it, right? We can. But I think that's one of the main points he's trying to bring across. Last verse, verse 7. He says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I ask myself, what are the immeasurable riches of, of his grace? What are they? Why does he not specify them? Why does he not list them? <laughs> Can you just make it easy? No, um, but I was like, what are they? Here's what I want to point out. The word of, O-F, of, can mean a bunch of different things. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. But as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, well, I, yeah, that makes sense. The word of can mean a lot of different things. The main thing that we go to immediately is the word of means possession, right? If I were to talk about my house, the house of Nate, Nate's house, right? That's possession, the house of Nate. But there are a bunch of different other ways that this can be used. I think that the way that this is used, he says the immeasurable riches of his grace. I think that the immeasurable riches are an attribute of his grace. And here's how it would read. The immeasurable riches which are his grace. Does that make sense? Right? Um, In Acts chapter 2... Peter says, the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? The gift of the Holy Spirit. I think it's the same thing. Are we talking about the Holy Spirit's gift? Or are we saying that the Holy Spirit is the gift? Right? I think it's the same thing. It's an attribute. It's a description of the noun. So I asked him, what are the immeasurable riches of his grace? It's his grace that are the immeasurable riches. You can read it this way. His grace is our wealth. His grace is our wealth. Or you can read it this way. We are wealthy in his grace. We are wealthy in his grace. We have more than enough. Whenever it says in kindness, I think of it this way. His kindness is what shows that his grace is immeasurable wealth. It's his kindness. Is, that's what shows it. Earlier it says, uh, in verse 7, it says, so that in the coming ages he might show. The word show here means to prove. So that he might prove it. How? With kindness. With kindness. And when we're talking about kindness, we're talking about generosity, right? We're talking about compassion. We're talking about love, loving kindness. And then he caps it off. He says, in Christ Jesus. If there's something you don't know about the Greek language is that oftentimes they flip their sentences compared to English. Their main point comes at the end. Their their subject comes at the end of a sentence. I think that's what he's doing here. Christ Jesus. I think he's capping it off. And he's saying it's all because of Christ Jesus that anything, any, any of this is possible. It's because of Christ Jesus that you have grace. It's because of Christ Jesus that you are saved. It's because of Christ Jesus that you are brought from death to life. It's because of Christ Jesus that you are raised. It's because of Christ Jesus that you are seated with God. It's all because of Christ. The entire Bible, including the New Testament, centers on Jesus, fixes their eyes on Jesus, points to Jesus. And there's, this passage is no different. I think he's literally saying, in Christ Jesus, all of this is possible. It's because of this. So I read verse 7 this way. I read verse 7 this way. In total, this reads, 
so that in the coming ages he might show or prove his kindness toward us in the immeasurable riches which are his grace, all because of Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that again. So that in the coming ages he might prove his kindness toward us in the immeasurable wealth which is his grace, all because of Christ Jesus. Here's my main point. I think that whenever it says, by grace you have been saved, um, ra he raised us up with him and seated us with him. I think that, that's kind of the center of this passage because I think that he's saying that grace is the gateway to glory. Grace is the gateway to glory. That's why I said they go hand in hand. Grace is the gateway to glory. But notice that he says, you are seated in heavenly places. You are not seated in grace. You are brought through grace to glory. That's the main thing that I think he's trying to say. Grace is the gateway. Grace is the doorway to glory. You do not stay in grace. Instead, you stay and live and you rest in glory. And here's the thing. Jesus lived in glory, did he not? Everywhere he went, God showed up. God did something. He showed, manifested, proved his glory. I think of Paul. I think of Peter. Right? We talked about this um, last few weeks. Peter walked and his shadow touched people, and as soon as it touched them, they were healed. That's what it looks like to live in glory. Right? I think that that's a byproduct of living in glory, but that's what it looks like. I guarantee you that Peter didn't even notice. I bet you he didn't even notice. He didn't even know until anybody told him later. I guarantee you. Why? Because he wasn't focused on anything but God. He was focused solely on Christ and the glory of God. That's the way I think about it. That's what it looks like. Grace is the gateway to glory. We are not seated in grace, but we are seated in glory. I got another passage. Turn with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is, this is the boldness part. We're going to start in verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3, 12. Let's go for it. All right, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who would put on a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains un unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, behold or reflect the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I want to focus on verse 18 here. I think that this is the center of it. Whenever he says, with unveiled face reflecting the glory of the Lord. He says unveiled, meaning there's, there's nothing that is impairing your vision. There's nothing that is fogging up your vision. There's no excuse. <laughs> there's no reason that you can't see God clearly. And it's because of who? It's 
because of Christ. Because before he says, only through Christ is the veil taken away. What I think he's trying to say is Christ's death was significant. And Christ's death, or sorry, Christ's resurrection was significant in removing that veil. Remember, Christ's death toward the veil in the temple. And Christ's resurrection, he rolled up his veil and he left it in the grave. And I think that that is what you have to do in order to reflect or behold the glory of the Lord. I think that's his main point. The central point of of this passage, I think, is this. We contain the glory of God because of his Holy Spirit, right? He says at the very end, he says, for this, reflecting the glory of, of God, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, it's because of the Holy Spirit that you are able to do this. He is saying that the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of God's of God. It is his glory. And where is the Holy Spirit? It's in you. You hold the glory of God. I think that's what he's that's one thing he's trying to say. We contain the glory of God because of his Holy Spirit. And we are meant to live in his glory continuously reflecting him and being transformed into the image of God which is Jesus. Right? That kind of brings it all home. We live, <laughs> I've said this before, we live in the Trinity of God. We have the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is what transforms you into the image of His Son, right? And if we are transformed into the image of His Son, <laughs> then we are reflecting the Father's glory. Isn't that crazy? We live in the Trinity of God. I'm going to say that one more time. (laughs) Can't get over it. We have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is who transforms us into the image of His Son so that we can reflect the glory of the Father. Man, that's crazy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back to my thesis, right? What does it mean to live in glory? It means to be hyper aware of God, to be hyper aware of him, constantly listening to him, thinking about him, allowing him to weigh in on your decisions, to, bold, to approach him with boldness, to approach him with confidence. It means to reflect his glory. It means to reflect him. It means to... Be a blessing rather than a burden. And then what does it mean to live in grace? It means to be hyper aware of yourself, to be hyper aware of your sin. It means to identify as a sinner and constantly rely on grace to save you rather than moving on to glory, to approach God with timidity and fear of judgment. I want to point out that in Ephesians, Paul says, by grace you have been saved You have been saved. To be transformed, I think it's talking about um, the next step. Right? But if you are constantly living in grace and relying on grace to save you, then I think that you aren't being transformed. There's not a transformation going on. I think Paul's, I think it's pretty clear. Paul says, you have been saved, right? Then he said, if you reflect the glory of God, then you are being transformed. So, here's the thing. To live in glory, um, to live in glory Um, whenever I think about, God, I want to live in your glory. I want to live in your presence. 
I want to walk everywhere I go is with you in your presence. It, it constantly reminds me that I have to not go back. I have to not go back and rely on grace. Because if I do, then I'm starting the whole process over again. Because I think that, I think that it's like subconsciously, um, the church, Christians, think that the way the new covenant works is not actually the way that it works. Um, I think that they, they get the old covenant and the new covenant confused. Because in the Old Covenant, what happened? You sinned. If you sin, you bring a sacrifice. And then you are saved. And then you can enjoy God's presence. But that didn't work. Why? Because it, it happened over and over and over again. And over again. But then God sent Jesus. So that we no longer have to offer a sacrifice every time because he is the ultimate sacrifice. He was offered once and he was offered for all and he was offered for all time. Right? Here's the thing. The process was sin, sacrifice, salvation. I didn't do that on purpose. That's three S's. I don't know. I don't know how that came up. Sin, sacrifice, salvation. Whatever. I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, But now, remember, Sacrifice was already taken care of. That's step two. That also means that step one was taken care of. Right? The only thing that's left is salvation. That's the only thing that's left. What does that mean? That's the only thing we need to focus on. It's the only thing that we rely on. We, we live in the promise of salvation. Right? We no longer live in sin. I'm not saying that sin doesn't happen. What I'm saying is that you don't live in it. I'm saying that it's not you. You don't identify with it. Why? Because the sacrifice was taken care of. That Therefore, the sin was taken care of. That's what it means to live in glory. To live in grace, I think, is to start the process all over. Sin, sacrifice, salvation. But I don't think that that's the way it works anymore. I think that that's why God sent Jesus. It's so that we can be with him always. Amen? That's all I've got for you. So... You want me to just go ahead and pray? And Guys, I really appreciate y'all. Um, I just want to add to the announcements real quick while I'm thinking about it. Um, we are having, we're not having youth today. Uh, we have a lot of uh, families or a lot of kids being gone because of family plans. And uh, I hate to, like, keep youth going. That way, like, a lot of them are just like, where should I put myself? You know, like, I, I just want to get rid of that stress. Okay, so... No youth today. Um, Also, we're still accepting donations for our rummage sale on the 28th. Really looking forward to it. Last year, we got to bless so many different people in our community. We got to give away um, clothes and um, baby baby stuff, like for next to next to nothing. It was really cool. So I'm looking forward to it again. But uh, yeah, if you want to donate something, you just want to give it away because it's cluttering your house. Uh, get with me or Jordan. We'll take care of it. All right. Um, thank you, guys. Let's pray, and then uh, yeah, you'll be you'll be dismissed. Lord, I thank you that you are constantly wanting to show yourself to us. That you are constantly giving us you. That you are not withholding yourself. Lord, whenever you gave us your Holy Spirit, you gave us all of you. You did not withhold any of it. I thank you that we can experience you fully, even now. Even now, even today. God, this is the best time to be alive. This is the best time to be alive. It's the best era 
to be on this planet. I thank you that you have set us in this era. God, we are abundantly blessed because of the era in which we live. We live in the promise of Jesus. We live in the era of of the King. We live in your kingdom. God, and we live with your spirit. I can't thank you enough. Lord, I pray that we would be constantly hyper aware of you. Hyper aware of you. Always thinking about you. Always wanting to hear from you. Always looking for what you want to do and what you are doing. And calling it yours. Lord, I pray that you keep us safe. Keep us in your fold. And um, I pray that you stay with us, Lord. Even though I know you already will. I seal it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Nate Shipman. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.